Hello, welcome to Palmarama Reviews, where we look at the wacky, sometimes woeful, but always wonderful world of film. In the episode today, we are looking at a film whose title alone managed to get it its full funding. It's quite apt, because it's also the title that got me interested in this film. It's also self-proclaimed the worst horror film of all time. Probably was back then. It certainly isn't now. This is Microwave Massacre. Made in 1979, but not actually released until 1983, which is why it's got that 70s vibe to it. The story follows the character of Donald, played by Jackie Vernon, who's a soft-spoken comedian who you may know as the voice of Frosty the Snowman from the Baskin Robbins Christmas specials. Dom, who is fed up with his wife's haute cuisine attempts, and one night can't take it anymore, kills her, accidentally eats her, and develops a taste... For human flesh. <laughs> like that pun? No? Good, because the film is full of them. Let's take a closer look at Microwave Massacre. Let's go. So, the film opens up with... Well, what else are you going to open a late 70s B-movie with? That's right, boobs! So as she's strutting her stuff down the sidewalk, it's intercut with footage of a construction site. Something we won't see for the rest of the film. And she looks through this conveniently shaped hole where we see Don and his co-workers having lunch. Something we will see more often. And come to think of it, I don't think we actually ever find out the name of his co-workers. She gets her bum pinched by a local sleaze and her chest gets stuck. It's conveniently shaped hole. Why do you ask? Well, apart from being able to show a pair of large naked knockers, it is just to set up this pun. I have to go to the restroom. I mean restroom. Be right back. <sighs> There's a lot of this. You think a scene is going somewhere, or if you think it's going nowhere, it's mainly just to set up a terrible pun. While she may have impressive tracts of land, these two are the biggest tits you will see in the film. Quite the double act, one being able to overact and the un underact. You gotta first feel. I can't understand that, Rosie. How can I feel music? We then cut to Donald's wife, May, played by Claire Ginsberg, who I thought had been in other things. The way she acts, she seems like she's not great, but it seems she's comfortable in front of the camera. Turns out, from what I can see on IMDb, this is her only credit. Quite a shame, I think she's quite funny in this. We see May bringing in the shopping. Now, according to the director, the original idea for the intro sequence was May going shopping and then her picking up bits of meat and then the credits being on those bits of meat she picks up. Sadly, the shop pulled out at the last minute and they were wondering what they could do instead. Two things came to mind and they decided to use those instead. We see May bringing in the shopping and look at the size of that microwave. I wasn't around in the 70s and I know uh, technology when it comes new is quite big, but I doubt those microwaves were that big. How we survived all that horrible food until I decided to do something about my cuisine. Sorry, what? My cuisine. <laughs> cuisine. Okay, then. Needless to say, the acting in this film is not what you would call good. Or decent. Or passable. Or subpar. A lot of that is because, especially in the house scenes, Everything had to be done on the first take. They were pressed for time and you can tell this film doesn't have a very big budget and film is expensive. That being said, it does give some hilarious one take shots. That classless jerk won't hold us back anymore. The next scene is at a local bar with probably my favorite character of the film, the grouchy bartender, Sam. Why? Because she's an idiot, that's why, Sam. Me, why are you telling me? What the hell do I care? Having been a barman for a number of years in a number of different establishments, I can 100% sympathise with Sam. Donald and his co-workers venture into the bar and poor fancy food Dom starts spitting his woes. My hemorrhoids. That's why I had to take this job standing up. Didn't I ever tell you about my hemorrhoids? <laughs> I love Sam. His face while Dom is just spinning his tail is just priceless and wins my Best Actor of the Film Award, which I've just come up with. Don comes home to his neighbours having a sexy style party, I think. <laughs> Look at that guy's face. He's just looking at Don as if thinking, ugh, pervert. 
that is the producer for this film as well. The next scene is a load of exchanges between Dom and May and it just drags. It's like some bad sitcom or I should say shtickcom because everyone in this film has to have a shtick. It's like those bits of dead air where you'd expect a studio audience to laugh if it was a sitcom. But it's not a sitcom, it's a film. The mood might give you ideas. I got an idea, all right. But I think it's against the law. <laughs> the scene goes on for way too long. Now, don't get me wrong. In his day, Jackie Vernon was a very funny comedian. And I do recommend you look up his holiday slides routine. It is very clever. But in this, every joke falls dead. The only good thing to come out of this scene is this transition joke here. Napoleon, he's better than you do. You know me, you're right. That is the only thing that made me laugh. Now, title sequence girl is back though on the scene and she gets immediately accosted by Creepy McCreeperson with some of the most horrendous, cringeworthy chat-up lines I've heard. What's up, baby? Want to feel my hard hat? Anything else hard I can offer you? Yeah, you don't think I make a play for every lady who comes by here, do you? Yes. Yes, you do. It's just that usually men are only after one thing. Yeah, how do they choose? Wait, that worked? Nope, nope, nope. That's killed my suspension of disbelief. Nope, sorry, nope. Can't do any more. Nope. No, 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 no. Don't care. Don't care. <laughs> there we go. Calm down now. Now, after getting absolutely plastered, Dom goes home and partakes in more sitcom shtick with May. <laughs> Don has the mildest of breakdowns I've ever seen on camera, gently throwing sofa cushions, because careful, you don't want to break the set or the props, which is actually quite true, because apparently, the house they're filming in actually belonged to Mickey Dolan from The Monkees. He was in the process of selling it and they only had two days to film. Which is why, like I said earlier, they had only one take to pretty much do everything. And it's another reason why they're eating off paper plates. <laughs> Wait, why does he turn to camera? This isn't a sitcom. It's a shtickcom. I'm surprised they didn't add this over the footage. <laughs> Don Kent stands no more and snaps and finally something happens in this film. The Don strangles man. Oh, oh, I do feel sorry for her if that is the last image she sees. He bashes her head with an overly sized salt shaker and I'm not entirely sure where her head is supposed to be. The way he's just thrashing around like that. <laughs> he throws salt over his shoulder because yeah, don't want to get any bad luck from killing my wife now, do I? There's no real sound of him hitting her on the head, so I decided to improvise. <laughs> and yes, I do do my own sound effects. How could you tell? <laughs> the next morning, Don wakes up with quite a headache, though probably not as bad a headache as May has. And amazingly, he can't remember what happened and starts looking for her. Now I've had some hangovers, bad, hangovers, but I've never woken up not knowing what's happened like before, especially when something significant has happened. Actually, yes, I have. Never mind, never mind. Move on, move on, next bit. He finds her, of course, in the microwave. How does she get in the microwave? How did she fit in the microwave? Probably a better question is how much of her is in the microwave. It's not that big a microwave. And considering he was bashing her head in so much, her head is surprisingly undamaged, which makes me think, how drunk was he to miss that much? Now, more shtick! He's in the microwave? I'm sure that would have been hilarious 20 years before the film was even made. That's the way she would have wanted to go. <laughs> Is it? He turns on the microwave and sets it to broil, turning it into the cuisine that she's always wanted, apparently. Don comes home after work and starts to cut May up, as you do. 
and wraps her in tinfoil, as you do. And I'm guessing people are easier to cut up and wrap up once they've had a long, good broil in the microwave. In this scene, Dom is watching TV and the content warning for this show is brilliant. A reminder that language on the following program, because of the sensitive, expressive, well shit, downright filthy nature, has been strictly edited. I, I really wish that they would do something like this for a TV show in real life. I can't mention the BBC saying anything like that though. Don gets peckish in the night and may have bitten off more than he could chew. <laughs> I'm not apologising for that pun. That fits right in with this film. <laughs> Meh. I suppose off to kidding her and chopping her up. The next logical step is to eat her, I suppose. We go back to Don and his co-workers having, guess what, their lunch break. I'm guessing when they're filming this on a construction site, it's such barren part they're only allowed to film on this tiny little bit time and time again after ribbing his wife for so long Dom decides to cook hers again not apologizing his co-workers think it looks too tasty to resist and want some for themselves and once again we have the perfect double team of underacting and overacting such an exaggerated move for a tiny bite say this is fantastic as is that expression, my friend. It seems like the mission meat has got his co-workers hooked, though they want something that's got less of an old and bitter aftertaste. That's not my joke, that is literally what is said in the film. While drinking in the bar, Dom comes across this Sigourney Weaver lookalike, who is either trying to eat a cherry or trying to look seductive with a cherry. Either way, she's failing. Turns out she's a prostitute called DDD and they have an exchange outside with the heady concoction of terrible acting and terrible jokes. And why is she called DDD? Well, you may not want to know, but here it is. My mother wanted to name me Delia, but uh, she stuttered. <laughs> oh yep, that was totally worth it. So was his follow-up joke. Hey, have you ever screwed in 3D? Prostitute shtick! He takes her home, but isn't in the mood to begin with. It's only when she says she's hungry that he decides to go for it. And what follows next is, uh, well, viewer's discretion is advised. Because of the sensitive, expressive, well shit, downright filthy nature has been strictly edited. <laughs> well, there's a reason she's keeping her eyes closed. I don't blame her. <laughs> yes, disapproving Beethoven is judging you. At least he can't hear it. Lucky bastard. Now DDD is dead dead dead, gets plonked onto the table and is set up for the line used in the trailer. I'm so hungry. I could eat a whore. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that's probably one of the best lines in the whole film. Damn, look at all that tin foil. I said this film didn't have a big budget. The budget was about $75,000 and it seems most of it was spent on tin foil and rubber arms. Seems Don is running out of supplies, so he needs to restock. And in this shop, we meet probably the strangest character in the film. And that is saying something. He kicks Don out, probably for being fed up with his shtick. But then we've got his shtick to deal with. Hello, Coast Guard? Coast clear? Good. Oh, it's you again. Well, we're closed. Everyone's got their own shtick. <laughs> We finish the trio of tripe scenes with something that I can't show you on YouTube. But basically, it's a naked woman on top of a novelty-sized piece of bread and having what I hope is mayonnaise spread over her and has the other novelty slice of bread on top of her and then cut in half. Yeah. You realise that after May dies, the story really doesn't have much structure. It tends to meander from one scene to another usually just to set up one crappy joke to another. For instance, the next scene where Dom comes across the street performers and the lead performer is a woman dressed as a chick. And the look on his face is like he's found the best thing ever. I could just think of it could be all these new possibility of sticky one-liners he can use to chatter up with, which he does. You're too good looking a chick to go around looking like a chick. And then, of course, he takes her back to his house. And it's a scene I can't show you, but it is pretty much just to set up this joke, I think. Oh, oh. I thought you were a leg man, oh. not a breast man. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Okay, enough of that, enough of that. He then sees a shrink who, of course, falls asleep 
while he's telling them everything and then they get their wires crossed about the meaning of what they're saying. Shrink stick! So we get this scene of foreboding where Dom has a heart attack. So this makes him go to a doctor called... Family room. The doctor's waiting for you. Because what else is he going to be called? We discover Dom has a pacemaker and then guess what? Oh, that's better. Uh, a bad habit I haven't been able to break since medical school. Uh, I used to practice in front of a mirror. Dr. Shtick! After killing another prostitute, Don comes out of his house and finds his neighbours doing some gardening using an interesting tool for the job, shall we say. Oh yes. That's what she's using. Now that's one very strange lady. Oh, I don't know. Considering some of the characters we've seen in this film, well, that just comes across as normal now. Don promises the guy something different for next time. He promises them... <sighs> Peking Chick. Oh, you mean Peking Duck, don't you? No. I mean Peking Chick. As Don is preparing his Chinese cuisine, we see some people coming up the driveway. Ooh, will he be discovered? How is this film going to end? Ah, you can't beat 70s fashion. May it never come back. What a place to be sleep. I don't think he's sleeping. Yep, that's right. He's dead. He just drops dead. How do you ask? Well... The microwave killed him. What an appropriate end, I feel. Now, apparently, Rodney Dangerfield was the director's original choice for Dom. But I find Jackie Vernon a much better choice. He's a much more laid-back character. And... I think with Roddy Dangerfield, it would have been even more of a grown fest of one-liners and more about him. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> I'm going to get killed by a microwave. What I do like is the credits are presented as a menu. So instead of the cast in alphabetical order, they are in how they are consumed. Uh, what I do really like, which I think is the best joke of the film, is the filmmakers thanking the microwave for being invented. Otherwise, the film couldn't have been made. And remember, dismember a friend for lunch. Well, that was Microwave Massacre. Obviously, it was slated by critics when it was first released. And it sort of fell into obscurity for quite a few years before it became on DVD, where it eventually gained the cult following that I think it deserves. You can tell this is one of those films that was made with a lot of labour of love. Not many people on the film had made a film before. In fact, Jackie Vernon seems to be the only person who'd been in a film or been on TV before this. It does show, but I think that's part of the charm. It is a fun film. It is so bad it's good. And I did laugh a lot while watching this film in ways I don't think they anticipated. In other ways, you know they were trying to get you to laugh more than anything. And I think this critic's quote sums it up best. Despite utterly failing as a comedy horror and pornography, Microwave Massacre is grotesque enough in its design and attitude to be fascinating, much like a car accident. I mean, you can't argue with that. Well, until next time, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.